Okay. Oh, hi, Marissa. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we have some people tuning in. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to Bok Bok. This is our second episode where we're going to be talking to um, an indie brand designer and asking them about uh, design inspiration, like origin stories, funny tips and tricks for making items with your hands. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so here today we have Arya, who is one half of Lilith A. Adalia. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna, you know, learn about her, learn about how she you know, runs her business and, you know, how she's been dealing with like pandemic stuff, like, you know, whatever, we'll see where this takes us. So um, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, like um, like we said here, um, I am Aria, I am one half of Lilith Edadalia and um, my other co-designer, Jen, is also, we kind of like do um, the work and stuff together, we like, pretty much 50 50 we kind of just like divvy out everything we make everything we do all the the stuff you don't really like to do like <laughs> the business stuff that is the other side of the creative stuff um, and social media posting graphic design like yeah everything we do it we yeah we've we've been doing it for about seven years now honestly like um mm -hmm. I kind of didn't realize it's been that long. Like, yeah, because 2013, is that seven years ago? Who even knows what time is anymore? I um, think so, yeah, because I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been in Lolita for eight years and I started in 2012, right? Mm. Well, it's 2021 now, so yeah. who knows? Passage of time happens, but time is a flat circle. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like we've been doing it for a while and it kind of like started out, you know, as like a hobby more so and it's kind of been in a hobby state for a while but now we're kind of like moving into like hey like this this is legit we got to get legit so that's kind of where we're at mm -hmm. yeah um so do you want to tell us a little bit about like your brand in terms of like what do you guys produce what's your aesthetic you know like what items do you put out sure so um it's interesting because um, when, we first, when we first started the brand, uh, we were doing primarily children's wear and it was kind of hilarious because I started out when I started on Lolita, when was it like 2008? I um, couldn't afford to buy anything. Like I was broke. Like I was a broke mm -hmm. kid from the Bronx. <laughs> I didn't have a job and I was just like, okay, I want these clothes, but um, you know, I can't afford them. So I started out making all my stuff myself and buying mm -hmm. like stuff off brand and like getting, you know, the body line stuff when I was finally able to get like some allowance to, and my mom will let me buy things from overseas. Like I, mm -hmm. was, I was real young when I started, I was like 16. And oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so it was, parental permissions up until I finally turned 18 and I could like have my own bank account and do all that mm -hmm. stuff. So um, yeah, so it kind of started out me making stuff for myself. Um, and then I think as I progressed, I started getting like better and better at, at things. I was like, oh, I should maybe I should go into business and do this like, cause I've seen, I saw other indie designers who that came before me like doing the thing and but I didn't really take it like something I'll actually end up doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then in college, like, and I know Jen, for instance, we were in high school. So she's kind of been with me for my whole Alita journey, even though she's mm -hmm. not Alita herself. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, so she's just, she's like very Lolita adjacent. Like she loves everything <laughs> aesthetically about Lolita fashion, mm -hmm. historical fashion. Like we've always been to like, into like vampire-y stuff and, you know, all the cringy stuff for when you're in high school. Love it. Yeah. We um, all have that experience. <laughs> yeah. And anime and everything. So we mm -hmm. just was like tight like that. And then we went to high school together. And then we also went to college together. We went to F FIT together, everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ultimately, ultimately, like towards the end of our like schooling time, we were in children's wear primarily. So we specialize in children's wear and we were like, this is what we want to do. We don't want to do anything else. So 
that kind of was the fuel to us starting the brand because when we graduated we were just like oh like let's start a children's wear brand because we did children's wear we could do this mm -hmm. um and so we did <laughs> that's wild that's just kind of what it was <laughs> that's just crazy to me as someone who also like graduated in fashion design i would never immediately just be like i'm gonna start my own brand that's so good <laughs> yeah like, we were just like impulsive like we i remember we were sitting <laughs> in our class and kind of like looking at everything we had made that semester and like we had because we had to do like a, a fashion show so our children's garments rock, walked on the runway and actually my dress was like the showstopper like fight finale dress which oh. kind of yeah so i was like it really drove me i was really passionate about children's wear and i still mm -hmm. am like, that's, mm -hmm. that's something i kind of want to touch upon later yes. but um yeah so we kind of were sitting around on like the last days of class like before graduation we're just like mm, we're gonna start a brand let's just do that real quick <laughs> <laughs> like what's yeah. that time time like before lunch let's just start it let's just do a brand yeah pretty much <laughs> it was real casual it was real casual. <laughs> so funny yeah. um so sarah is saying i feel the vampire anime thing so hard <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my god that yeah i, I was <laughs> i was very cringy and i i wholeheartedly lean into it <laughs> nowadays i think it's like something you just have to embrace Mm -hmm. like today I'm just like, yeah, I am cringy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I still am in a lot of ways. So I'm just mm -hmm. like, eh, it's never gone away. <laughs> yeah. So when you, you, because you like made this decision so casually to like just start a brand, when you first started, did you know what you were getting into? Did you feel prepared by like your education to like start a business? Well, yes and no. <laughs> that's kind of like the long and short of it. Like mm -hmm. it makes, cause I, I've always been very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny when I was growing up, I would try to find any type of way to make some type of business. Like mm -hmm. I remember that time I was like saying, if I wanted to sell beanie babies, like secondhand beanie babies. Oh, yeah, no, but when, during like the craze. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the craze, like, and I got, like, collected all these, like, because McDonald's was doing, like, oh, the ones. Yeah, the little baby ones, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get all of these, and I'm not going to take them out the package, because then I'm going to resell them to people on the street corner, literally, that was Wait, a business idea. Were you yeah. successful at that? No. Like, did people, <laughs> I don't know. No way I'm going to buy them? No, I don't think my mom would allow me to like, I was literally, I'm going to go on the street with a box. I made like a box with all of them like laid out with like, oh yeah, I was that kid. I was like, always like, what can I make it to a business? Like, yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, it started young. Um, so I kind of always had that mindset and then, um, getting into it, I just was like, oh, we could, we could figure it out. I could, I could figure out anything. So, um, initially I was just like, okay, we'll just make a bunch of stuff and sell it on Etsy and see who buys it. And it was pretty solid. We, we had a really good foundation. And when it comes to like um, our schooling, um, definitely from a construction perspective, we were pretty solid with what we were doing. Yeah. Um, so the, from the technical aspect of it, of course we were like building, you build your skills as you go along. Like it kind of just, just go, go through the motions and you get better and better as you do things. like mastery is like a, a lifelong thing is something yeah. I'm always saying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like from a construction aspect, I feel like we were definitely covered. But when it came to the business stuff, um, I would say I didn't really learn that until I started working in the industry, not mm -hmm. really from my experience um, in FIT per se, because it's like they divide, like there's a track for people, you know, who are doing more of the creative stuff and yeah. then the track for the people who are doing the more business stuff but in my opinion i feel like everybody should be learning everything i agree yeah. yeah and and that's very much lacking so i hope in the future that changes but um i learned more about like production like things when i started working full-time and i worked in children's wear companies too up until i ultimately left the industry which we'll mm -hmm. get into later also but um i learned a lot more about the business and production side once I was like working, working. And Jen is the same way. Like she also worked in on um, full time in like a bunch of different um, fashion companies. And that's where she was able to get, gain some more of that like 
skill of knowing like, oh, this is what we're really getting into. And then it kind of started shaping how we considered our own um, choices and what we were going to do in the business, what we could and couldn't do, which is a lot of things that you can't do, which is yeah. what you learn as as you go along. Oh, I can yeah. do, yeah, like you think, oh, I could do this, I could do that. Like, and then ultimately it's like, mm, actually we don't have like $50,000 in the bank to just like- yeah. or like, you know, home. you can't produce like a certain number of units. <laughs> like, right. exactly. You're limited in terms of like, not just like people power, but like you can't buy certain things unless you want to do it wholesale. Right, exactly. So those things we learned a little later and then that's kind of what, you know, delayed us. Like there were a few years between that like seven year span where we like didn't really produce anything. We're just like reassessing everything. Mm -hmm. um, life gets in the way and all that other stuff. Because when you own a business, you're like, oh, I, I'm choosing my personal life and my business, and then I'm also working full time. So it, it's like your life starts getting like weirdly carp, carp, like just segmented. Yeah. And, and you gotta make some hard choices. Yeah, and another thing is like, <laughs> designing full time is so much hard. I, I don't wanna be like, I, I, I wanna say it is harder than like most jobs. So <laughs> not, not to, not to, you know, dismiss other jobs because they are difficult but just in terms of like the number of hours and the kind of like mental toll it takes designing full-time it just takes a lot out of you and like how the heck are you supposed to focus on anything else creatively right right like, that's and, so impressive to me yeah and i feel like another part of it is like you know people on the outside kind of think like oh you do fashion oh that's so fun and i'm like <laughs> no it's really not like people just think we're like I don't know, running through, I don't know, fabric and frolicking in the office or something. I don't know what people think we're doing. Maybe like, like just like drawing whimsical designs and yeah. just throwing it out there. Like, ah, it's beautiful. It's <laughs> none of that. It's a lot of answering to CEOs and salespeople. And when you try right. to do yes. something creative, yeah. And then when you try to do something creative, they're like, no, we can't do that because, you know, this sold last year. So we're going to do that same thing again. And it's just yeah. like, oh, so what I'm doing here is not really creative, which kind of yeah. like led me into being more on the technical production side towards the end of my career. Cause I'm like, oh, my creativity is being wasted here. I'm going to just do something completely different in the industry until I eventually just end up leaving it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of choosing children's wear, is there any reason like, what made you initially go into children's wear and you know, why, like what, what led you to the passion for that? And like, how did that translate into working in children's wear in the industry? Good question. I'm, it is kind of like a weird winding road because when I first started high school, because I went to high school fashion industries, mm -hmm. like yeah, so I had like a module in the be very beginning, like in my freshman year, where they kind of start you off with children's garments because it's small, it doesn't have a lot of fabric. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn like the sewing fundamentals on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, there's also like this other practice where you make like half size garments where it's like scaled down and you have to like make it and but I don't I don't know I feel like it's a small mannequin to put it yeah, on it small it yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> it was so weird like I mean I it helped but like you know it's kind of easier to do a children's garment because it's like oh it's a fully finished garment and it's like it's made for a specific size and you kind of learn a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. So they start us off that way. And then when I first first started um like thinking about what my future career was. I'm like, oh my God, I want to do children's wear. Cause it was kind of like what I was introduced to in the beginning. And, and then I made this really um, cringy project. I remember my freshman year, which was like a mixture of like Lolita fashion and children's. And it was, it was terrible. It was very, <laughs> <laughs> it was very not, um, not good if I, I would say, but I mean, maybe people would think otherwise, but it was like gothic children's wear, which was strange to a lot I of mean, people. I feel like there's, there's just got to be a market for that. Yeah, I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like if I were to like revisit that one day, like 
make it a little bit better, maybe it'll be something. And I feel like it could be. Goth kid, goth kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was my first, first collection. So I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do kids wear. And then um, that kind of like stayed with me for a while. And then I started getting more into Lolita and I started to see parallels. Of course, like, you know, we all know that like Lolita fashion is not like larger size kids clothes like yeah. people might think but at least when it came to like the finishing techniques and some of like the pattern techniques and stuff are very mm -hmm. similar um in terms of like the silhouettes and everything so it kind of translated in my mind a little bit um more directly um and then when i got to college i started out doing evening gowns because that was the other track it was Whoa, like okay yeah that so makes sense, that, though. <laughs> I was like, I wanted to do bridal and evening gowns and learn like advanced like sewing techniques and embellishments and stuff. And I still love that stuff to this day. Mm -hmm. But when I reached my final project in my second year of college, it was to make a purple taffeta. Um, it was a purple taffeta, like sort of like I think it was like a we had to do something like a celebrity would wear to the Oscars or so something like that. OK, yeah. So my dress i thought i was on the right track until i realized the day before i was due that i patterned made the pattern for the top of the dress completely incorrectly on the day before it was due no. and i stayed up all night until dawn to correct it and finish my dress that was due the next day and i didn't get any sleep and I ended up missing my other class in that that morning because I was I just I couldn't move like my body just gave out. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I like what I'm talking about. Like it's really it's it's very taxing. Like it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. So my body like gave out after I finished. My mom was like, "You're not going anywhere because I don't want you to like like keel over in the middle of the street." So right, I, like you might get like you know what not watch for traffic or something. At that point, you're so just sleep deprived. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So um, it was just like, oh my God, like it was so hard. And at that point I was like, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> like evening gown, it was, it was just so much, even though I really loved it. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm, I'm glad I made that choice because my friends who actually did do evening wear, they were d dying. And like, it's rough. Cause you got to pay for all your material yourself. Hun like yards and yards and yards of very 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 expensive fabric, like right. and that's your project. Like you have to do all that, and I'm like, I'm already broke. I don't, I can't like be yeah. in this like so heavily. I felt for my friends who actually went down that track, but I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do children's yeah. wear less yard. That's true. You have to buy some less. Yeah, it's smaller scale, mm -hmm. less yardage. I can still do special occasion, which is my favorite thing but I'll mm -hmm. do it on a smaller scale and it'll be cute and it'll be nice and I'm gonna enjoy it and I was so happy I did that because my last couple semesters at FRT were a breeze everybody else was crying and workroom and stuff and I'm just like oh my dress is done I'm like, just making a tight dress I don't know why you guys are like freaking out yeah, yeah. so I, I made the right choice there I, I kind of wish I was able to take some of those like advanced um finishing and like um embellishment classes though because yeah. like you got to do corsetry you got to do oh, like yeah. make bustiers and some of the some of my classmates and like fellow like the fellow students made some amazing stuff and i'm like damn i wish i could have been in that class and did that too but i'm like but i'm also happy with my little dress and my little flowers <laughs> and my little embroidery over here too so yeah I, it was okay mm -hmm. yeah so that kind of led me into children's wear like it was just like my it just stayed my favorite thing for a long time mm -hmm. yeah so when you graduated and ended up like working in the children's wear industry um was it what was that kind of like what you expected to do in terms of work um for children's wear or was it like not the same thing both <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's my answer to everything, but it's, yeah. it's like <laughs> nonsense and greatness. So mm -hmm. initially I was like really happy. My first job, I got it right after college. I, I was one of the lucky ones who didn't have to like scrounge around for work because since the children's wear like division in school was so tiny, yeah. nobody wants to do it. It was yeah. our class had 11 people in it. Like it was just like, 
And we had so many resources because like, there's not that many of us. So it was great. Mm -hmm. So I was able to secure a job right after college through an internship I had to do for my final semester. So when I finished internship, they moved me into part-time and then they moved me into full-time. Right. I just got funneled right in. Like there was no mm -hmm. reason. I feel as if, I don't know if this is the case, but it feels like that's the, um, is that, that's an experience for many people who decide to go into children's wear because yeah. I graduated in a class of like maybe, I want to say less than 20 people for the entire fashion like department. And mm -hmm. we had one children's wear designer and she also did an internship and just immediately went to go do her job. She works yeah. just wearing dog clothes now. Oh, cool. <laughs> Like, it, yeah, I think for children's wear, like, that, that's actually, if you're thinking about, like, a gateway and a, a, a small gateway in, I feel like children's wear is, like, a good step. But it has regular like, women's wear is so competitive. Super. Like, no, one, no one gets the job in designing yeah. if you're doing regular ready-to-wear women's wear. And it's even worse if you do evening wear. All my friends who did evening wear, they don't, they just, they don't hire and the people who are in it are a lot of older, older women from like Eastern Europe and like, mm -hmm. uh, like it's very, they, they stay in those jobs. They're still there. Like yeah. they're, they're, they're still in those work rooms, making those embellishments and doing all that finishing work that they've known for generations and generations. Yeah. And you don't have anything on them because they're so old. They know everything. They know everything. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they don't leave the job. So you're like, hey, I want to be like an apprentice or whatever. And a couple of my friends were able to do that for a while, but no one really took them seriously. And it just, you're just always like struggling, at least from my friends' experiences. Mm -hmm. So yeah, children's wear, they like, oh, you're ready? Okay. And then they see FIT is on your resume or whatever. Like, okay, you got a job. Like it, it just, it's very, very easy. And there's, there's good and bad things about that, like this about that system, but like, you know, it, it kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got to do initially, I started out at a company called Dolly and Me, uh, which was a subsidiary of um, Con Lucas um, is one of the biggest, one of the biggest like retail private brands um, in, I guess, in the country, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, they downsized a lot in recent years, but at the time it was like the biggest one. So like I got into like that company and I'm like, okay, that's, they were producing pretty much all the mid tier market clothes for like all your big box store brands or whatever, Walmart and Kmart and all those places. Um, so I started off in Dolly and Me, which was like dolls, clothes and kids clothes. So I got to do both. Fun. Yeah, that That's was fun. that was a great time. I loved that working in that division. Like the people I work with were really great. Like um, I was able to learn a lot from other women of color who just kind of like wanted to see me succeed. So mm -hmm. I'm like really thankful that I had that foundation in the beginning. Like they taught me everything they knew because they were like, okay, like there was no shortage of specifically women of color. Mm -hmm. and that I, I'm gonna like shout them out because they held it down for me. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to see me thrive and they wanted to see me like grow. So mm -hmm. they would tell me everything and like, oh, this is what we were doing here. This is maybe not part of your job, but I want you to know anyway. So all of that, like, it was great. Um, that was, that was great. But unfortunately, as I moved further along, I ended up not being in Dolly and Me anymore. Um, I moved into the infant toddler girls sort of like frilly dresses, play wear type of thing, which was like, I had to leave the de upstairs office, which was a lot nicer and go mm -hmm. to the upstairs office that was not as nice. <laughs> um, it was kind of old fashioned, um, but it was still great because I was able to work with like the sample makers who are mostly, they were either East Asian women or um, women from Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so there was like a mixture of like, they were like, most of them were Chinese, I think. Yeah, most of them were Chinese and then also like Mexican women. Mm -hmm. um, so there'll be like a mixture of like Chinese and Spanish in the world. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, and it was cool because I got to like meet people from different cultures and mm -hmm. then I was coordinating a lot of the samples and then I'll just see all these like cute little frilly dresses just like come to life. Yeah, like being produced in front of your eyes. Yeah, in front of my eyes. And it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're 
so so skilled like everyone oh, who works there amazing. that's the thing it's like all of these people are just like old ladies who are making the all like anything that's like in, in a sample house or anything like um for my work we had like an entire like upstairs like full of them and then like when we downsized during pandemic there's only like a few of them now and i'm like who the hell is going to be doing this like in the next 20 years Nobody. there's no young people going into like sample like sewing in that kind of setting right right and it's, it's always been so alarming to me because i'm like yeah a lot of them were like older women and they who were, has these skills no one and they sew so, so fast yeah exactly like they can finish like entire garments in a day yeah like like i could i couldn't even do that myself i'm just like <laughs> oh i want to be like y'all um so i'm like aspiring to that still but and you know they have all the industrial machines and all the stuff like um, my workroom is just all, you know, home machines and I do what I can, what I have. Like if I had, if I had more, I'd do more, but you know, it is what it is, but yep. it was just amazing. And I learned so much from like all, everyone I worked with, like it was amazing. And I also had another, again, a woman of color. Her name was Elaine. She was the head pattern maker. She would let me like kind of shadow her in the workroom sometime. And I would see what she does. And she would tell me all the things I had to do if I wanted to be in her position one day. So she was kind of like, you know, teaching me the ropes again. Mm -hmm. uh, it just sucked because like a lot of the higher ups, like I'm I'm on the ground doing the grunt work. And, yeah. But I mean, I enjoy it because I like really hands on stuff, but it just sucks because like you're doing this hard work and you're realizing you're not getting paid for the level of work you're doing. Yeah, like the amount of experience that's needed and the amount of like um, like handy work that's like technical skill is so much for that kind of job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as much as I enjoyed working with the people I worked closely with, because I'm a very hands-on person. I like to be involved with everybody. I like to talk to everybody. I just want to learn from everybody. Like I'm like a sponge. But then <laughs> other people, yeah, like other people are just like, oh, I don't, they, like they will barely come into the workroom and they'll just show up when they want to like stir things up or like make drama or whatever. Like some mm -hmm. of the, and I hate to like, bad mouth people but it kind of is it's the truth like mm -hmm. there was just a lot of like petty behaviors and i've heard that about i feel like it's especially in terms of, like the design side of things like just weird co-worker shit like there's a lot of um competitiveness because you're vying for like similar positions and people are like, oh, like you know I'm, I'm slightly like above you higher like hierarchy wise so i'm gonna make your life a living hell Yes. And that is what kind of tarnished my experience at that company. It was just because there was a lot of that and it was really unfortunate. And it was like, I noticed it was kind of baked into the industry as a whole, because as I progressed into different companies, I saw it everywhere I went. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what the company name was, who was in charge. It was everywhere I went. And it didn't help that the industry is so tiny, especially with children's wear it's like a niche within a mm -hmm. niche. So a lot of the same people, you work with them in different companies. Like I've seen people like move around. I'm like, oh, you're trying to get a job here. I work here. And like, it's, it's a very close knit thing. So it's almost like you feel like kind of trapped with yeah. this whole mess forever. Mm -hmm. And it's not fun. Yeah. And like it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the same here. It's like, I feel like I know, like, you know, the people that I know, I know like where they move in certain companies and you hear the same thing all over and we're on different sides of the country. <laughs> like, you know, it's just the same, you know, like the situation that you're going through, I feel like it's just like, I, I feel like um, not there's probably not so much overlap between New York and like where, where I'm working or, you know, kind of California, like, fashion industry stuff but the culture is still the same which is yeah. disappointing <laughs> it's, it's, I started to realize like as I went along I thought I thought it was like a me problem but I had to like dismiss myself like no I do good work I I'm a team player I like to you know cooperate with everybody I don't care mm -hmm. about hierarchies I don't care about none of that I just want to make sure we get the things that we have to do done whatever yeah. like, problems with other people care about hierarchies yep Yep, that's the problem. And I'm just like, oh, I don't have no time for this energy. Like, <laughs> I just want to produce, like, good things. And then even then, that comes with its baggage because a lot of the companies I work for, again, 
your Walmart, they're selling to places like Walmarts and Kmarts. And so there's a lot of cutting costs and, yeah. um, you know, bad factory practices and exploitation yep. and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So I had to kind of start to contend with like, I may be a good person in my day to day, but I feel like there was an ethical dilemma yeah. on that I had to contend with as I was like, okay, if I'm going to keep working in these companies, <laughs> like it's, it's a challenge. You're just like, what, what do you accept? And what do you, where do you put your foot down? So right. that's no, I feel that. I'm going through that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's part of it. It's just like, you realize, oh, I'm doing harm and I have to accept that in some way. And then I have to make decisions about like, am I going to fight against the system or am I right. going to move on to something different and it's a lot it's it's nothing that either of us can just solve by ourselves so yeah it's like another thing it's like to have to think about is like if that's your chosen profession and you decide to stick with it then it's like well you need to work make money and feed yourself somehow but then it's like how do i how do i have a job that's ethical yeah. <laughs> and, and now any job is like purely ethical the way, yeah. the way our society is right now it's pretty pretty much you're probably not no matter how yeah. you slice it and dice it is like right. hey, there's always something yeah. which i don't know to, to any of the viewers and stuff like obviously um if you take on anything any job like it's going to be like there's going to be some things about it that just are not going to be ethical because of the way we are like in terms of like capitalism don't worry about it um mm -hmm. <laughs> but specifically about the fashion industry and the textile industry that's just notoriously bad for like the environment bad for like um you know uh just people's livelihoods exploitations like it's 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 a hard thing to contend with being in the fashion industry because you know that all this shit is going on like behind closed doors yeah for sure for sure and 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 even like thinking about how we're moving forward our business now, it's like, we have to make a lot of considerations about like, where are we sourcing our materials? Like mm -hmm. how are we conducting our business? Like, you know, and it's sometimes it can be very challenging to find out where things where things actually come from. Cause yeah. there's a lot of like lobbying and red tape and all these things around like tracing, like sourcing your material and like all yeah. those things. Yeah. Because right now, right now they're trying to um, ban, uh, you know, cotton that comes from China because of, you know, like forced labor, right? But it's almost impossible to trace because cotton all gets like mixed together. It comes from different places over the world and that's how you buy it. Yep. It's like a whole thing. Yep. It's, it's rough. So yeah that's a whole that's probably like a whole another panel in oh god yeah let's talk about let's talk about something more fun <laughs> so yeah so going back to your own brand um so how is that different than working in the children's wear industry um and because when you when you started your brand um you started doing children's wear mm -hmm. So was that different than, how, how was that different than working, doing children's wear in the fashion design industry? And at what point did you decide to kind of not do that anymore? Right, so it's very different. So when, when I was in the fashion industry, everything is like this systemic process that's like very bureaucratic. And like this one person who decides like, oh, I. For instance, as an example, like I got this sample from Paris on a tri Paris trip or whatever. And they bring back the sample and they're like, okay, we want to do something like this, but we can't afford this part, that part, this part, that basically cutting the thing apart. Like, oh yeah, we have to modify this. Mm -hmm. And then um, me, who at the time I was doing, being like an assistant designer before I moved into like a technical space um, and more production side space, um, I would take it to my senior designer we would kind of like look at all the different inspirations and stuff. And she would like come up with some spins on the different samples and stuff that they brought back from wherever they brought them from. And sometimes mm -hmm. they would even bring samples like, which would confuse me um, when they would bring samples from like Walmart already and say, we want to make this. I'm like, but 
<laughs> it's literally you bought it from there. <laughs> why, why would we do that? And then it'll be like, oh, because Walmart wants this, and because they have so much money, they kind of dictate the design of everything. Yeah, and you're pretty yeah, much you're really just up. yeah. You're at the will of your buyer. You're at the will of the sales people. You're not really designing because they're just kind of like, hey, look, this sold well for these people. Let's make it too. I'm like, there's no innovation to that. There's no like creativity to that. There's maybe a little bit, but it's not that much. So I didn't like that. And it, it just kind of annoyed me because every five seconds we were just kind of like buying things and knocking it off instead of like actually being creative. And I remember a few times I was actually able to design something from my head because my, um, it's a little bit of a nightmarish thing, but my senior designer went on vacation and I was going to go on vacation literally a few days after her. So uh -huh. um, I remember our, our boss who was like the head of like, what is she like the VP or something? I forget what it is, but um, <laughs> some, some, lady, some lady above us, like she was like, oh, well we need X amount of dresses by next week. I think I honestly think it was just something just to be mean. I I, I believe that. Like she was just trying to make us really stressed out before we were going to go on vacation. I think because she was jealous. But that's another story. But that's the type of drama you deal with. It's like really high school petty drama. It's very unfortunate. But um, so I had to just like pull a bunch of dresses out of my ass oh my in God. like five days. So I remember being like so stressed during that time. Oh my God. But like, it just is like all this excess of stuff. And then you find out later on that they cut half of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, so that was all a waste of my time and stress. Okay, cool. So that type of stuff. And, and it, it comes with the territory, but it's like that. I didn't like that. So like when it yeah, comes you have to not be invested. <laughs> You can't you can't be too invested. And I learned that this that was early in my career, but as I like got older and I'm like, oh, none of this matters. And also they can kind of like fire you at any time, which happened to me twice. And it's never because of my job performance, it's just because of restructure. And so I'm like, oh, it's like you start you just start to understand like none of this really matters. So what can I do on my own and kind of like uplift my spirit in terms of like what I want to design, which is mm -hmm the energy we brought into the brand because both me and Jen were kind of dealing with the same things over the last few years. So we're like with the brand, we could just kind of like make whatever we want. Mm -hmm. So we would shop the local fabric stores and stuff, which is good because like you're just buying leftover fabric that's yep. kind of like in the market. So mm -hmm. And a lot so of times it's like good stuff that is like leftover from like, you know, bigger like uh, designers and like, you know, custom, like very good quality stuff that you could just buy yeah yeah exactly so i i love that even though it's very grueling to shop all those stores it's it's physically tiring like but it, it's it, it's worth it because then you get to like touch everything and see everything that's kind of like something i miss about yeah. the, the pandemic like you can't just roll up i mean we were able to but it's like very limited like mm -hmm. we used to in and out of the fabric stores all the time when we were in the city all the time. And now that we're, we're more isolated to our homes, we're not in the city all the time. So you can't just pop in and browse at whenever yeah. you gotta like calculate it, like think about it, like, you know, what you wanna do. Like, oh, I have to make sure we hit all these places. Go yeah. in places. Yeah, like, <laughs> what is that? So <laughs> I don't know anymore. So it's like, um, when we were able to, like, to do our first collection, we bought all the fabrics locally and we're like, we designed everything ourselves and we came up with a theme and our first theme was like inspired by, um, Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. Yes. So, um, the collection was called Petite Antoinette and everything, yeah, so everything was like mini versions of like some of the, some of the dress, like little inspirations from the dresses in the movie and also like, um, like different inspirations from like Rococo and everything like that. So mm -hmm. it was super fun. Cause we were just like, we had full reign on anything we wanted to do. We, we don't have to answer anybody. We don't have to worry about what's selling in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't care about Walmart. Um, Walmart is almost like a dirty word for some of us. We're just like, like don't say Walmart to like anybody. In I have a confession. I actually worked for Walmart as like a freelancer for a while. 
Was it rough? It was actually fine because it was in like a separate location where it was just like the photo studio and that environment was like very chill. Good. Um, but it was also like kind of like, oh, I fucking work for Walmart. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't even want to get into that. Like Walmart is rough. Like when you hear Walmart, it's, Walmart, it's like every everyone all hands on deck. Everything has to like shut down we have to make sure we're doing everything for walmart because it's multi-million dollar orders and so it's just so many things wrong with that <laughs> but um yeah so i just was like oh like i don't want to deal with that so it, it was fun being able to just like do whatever we want and it's like hey like it's it's all up to us we make everything we design everything no one can say whether or not this is like sellable or not like we'll see when we sell it <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's just on us yeah which come also has its challenges too, because it was a few things that we um, that we didn't sell very quickly, because I guess like people wanted certain things, like we noticed a certain colors things sold better than others. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not really a pink person, but you know, generally speaking, like clothing marketed to little girls is very pink, and um, yep. so I noticed like the few things that we did make in pink, maybe it was like more subdued and it didn't maybe didn't sell as well or other things sold as well. It's just like a lot of like things you had to kind of figure out, which right. is a challenge because you're it's all on you. You don't really have like the the history. And then when we were just starting out, of course we didn't really know what was gonna sell, what was not. We're just like, I like this, I'm gonna make this. And it's right. just, you kind of just gotta run with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um after making children's wear for your own brand, how did you end up making Lolita? Yeah, that's a fun, fun <laughs> story. Um, so of course, like I was used to making all my own, like a lot of my own things for a lot of years. And then eventually I was able to afford to buy brand. Wow, when I was like, like after working at all these like devilish fashion jobs, I actually had a little bit of money to buy brand. Yay. Something uh, worth it? <laughs> Maybe not, but Maybe. hey, you have brands. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I was like, okay, I still have that experience. But I, was, I was like dead set. Like when I say I was dead set in the beginning, I'm like, I'm not making Lolita stuff. Like I'm not starting a Lolita brand. Like I was so <laughs> set on not doing it. And then I was telling Jen, I'm like, no, we're never going to do that. We're only going to do children's wear. Like we're not getting caught in this crap. It's so funny. I was so serious. <laughs> I know it, it's just like what but yeah so then on t during the like it was like the height of the tumblr days yes. and we would we had our own tumblr page for our brand and we were promoting everything on tumblr like primarily for like a really long time and everybody in the comments or the mentions are like where's this dress in adult size are you gonna make it an adult size is this gonna ever be in bigger size are you gonna make lolita dresses and it just was like every single time we posted something and I was like I don't think we can ignore this anymore <laughs> yeah and I think because people kind of knew I already had like a background in like Lolita sewing from like the so lowly days and yep. I've been around I'm just like I don't I think I, I don't think I could dismiss myself as a Lolita sewist if I'm it just it just didn't work like it it, it was so interlocked mm -hmm. that Everybody's like, no, you're gonna do this. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm making Lolita dresses now. Sure, everybody. And yeah, the rest is history. Like literally that's what happened. And and then we kind of like, we we only made that one like children's collection that one time in the beginning. And then we never, oh, wow. we never made another one. Like we just did like a couple of one-off dresses for somebody's, I did a co communion dress once I did, um, no, Jen had made a, oh yeah, it was two communion dresses. We had two communion dresses, um, a flower girl dress that kind of didn't work out. That was a bit of a learning experience. Like we, because the, the person who was like bought it, they gave us incorrect measurements for their kid. <gasps> and then we shipped it out and it didn't fit the kid. And it was like a whole mess. And I'm like, this is why. I, I this feel is like why. Dumb, though. To measure your kid correctly, goddamn. Oh my God. Like it was. Rough. And that's why I don't really like trust a lot of, um, I like to make sure I got my measurements solid on my end. So I'm like, mm -hmm. if somebody gives me a weird measure. I'm like, no, that can't be right. Like we got to look right. at it. Yeah, so yeah. 
I learned that the hard way, unfortunately, but it's, it's part of the process. And, and thankfully the person, um, she was really understanding and she, we, she didn't get mad. She'd still give us a good review and everything because we worked the whole situation out. So mm -hmm. uh, bless good customers. Please, yeah. please be nice to your seeds. So, so, <laughs> like, please, because it, it, when something happens, we feel like so sad and we don't want, we don't want any of that. So like, well, we worked it out with them. So that was great. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, like then we kind of went full speed ahead with like, we're going to do Lolita stuff. And actually, no, we didn't go full speed ahead. We actually had a hard delay in the beginning because um, <laughs> we had all these ideas for designs and we kind of like put them out there and then people were just like, when are you going to make these? And then we're just like, I don't know. <laughs> that was like in the first, the first year of us like promising to make like adult clothing, it kind of flopped. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's part of the process. And I don't know, I don't even know if people really remember that anymore, but it was just like, yeah, we promised we would do this, but we never got around to it, but you know, we didn't take any money. We didn't take free orders or anything. Right. It's not like you like didn't, it's not like you took money, like didn't like deliver. Exactly. So, Cause that, fine, we, whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it just kind of like, we're like, it, we got a rough, it was a rough start. And we're just like, like we never like followed through with that. Are we really doing this? And it's like, let's try again. So then we tried again and then mm -hmm. we were more successful as we went along. So it ended up turning out okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the model that you use for coming out with like designs um, is more of a one of a kind kind of basis where you only make a look one of some like a, a like a more elaborate design. I feel like your brand is known for like really good construction, really good handiwork. And then you just sell like the one thing. Um, do you want to elaborate on like why that is your process and how you decided to kind of like do this version rather than like trying to put out like a lot of different, a, a lot of you know one item. It's like a little bit more simple. Right. Yeah, that is that is something that, you know, we kind of discuss a lot recently because we kind of look at like how other people are kind of like modeling their business and then thinking about why we're doing it our way. Like initially, um, we did the one one of a kind thing because we would just like we weren't really sure how much we could actually produce up front. Mm -hmm. So we're like, let's go to safe route and kind of just like make more one-off pieces we can just kind of like focus on the construction and the detail work and really make them really really good one-of-a-kind garments mm -hmm. and that's fun and it's also easier to maintain when you work full-time on the side um and you're doing this on the side if you're doing your bits on the side because you don't have to like you know you can just kind of focus in on one or two things at a time mm -hmm over a longer period of time. But the problem with that, of course, is that it's not very scalable. And you can't make a lot of quantities, the less quantities you make, the less money you make. And it just is like the cycle. And mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to make like simpler pieces and more quantity, but it's just like, we really like doing the really intense like fabric manipulation and embroidery and like heavy detail work stuff. And so we kind of was like, oh, we could still do the one of a kind thing, but it's starting to slowly become like this. Um, a, not, I don't want to say it's like a blocker, but we do want to like produce more things, but it's just a lot harder with the way that we kind of conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder, but it's it's easier like in, in both ways. Cause I enjoy it. I enjoy like kind of making one off pieces and putting my all into those like those items and they're being really special for people but it takes a lot more time and um you can't make like 10 even 10 like if it's hard enough to like, try to make two or three of like the same thing and mm -hmm. um, i also have a problem of like i get a little bit bored <laughs> over and over like I'm really honest like yeah. like <laughs> designs that we have that i know people are just like i want that too and um and I'm like, I know, I wish I could just like press a copy paste button oh and it's like, weird because I don't really want to make it again because I'm my brain already like kind of moved on to the next thing. It's That's just so funny. It's just 
the curse of a creative mind. Just like, I don't want to make that dress again. And no, one <laughs> I don't want to make it again. And I feel like I talk about this with Haley a lot as well. She also goes like, oh, like, you know, people want more of the same thing, but I already made it a bunch of times. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, I definitely feel that way about like a couple of dresses that we made multiples of. Like sometimes Jen will make, like, I think the last commission that we had done, Jen had made a re a redo, a, re a new version of something that I had designed. Um, but it's just like, we both get tired of it too. It's, just yeah, like, it's definitely a, a creative person thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like, we're, we're not robots. So we're kind of just like, once I did it once, I'm like, it's done. And like, everyone's like, oh my God, I want one too. I want one too. And I'm like, I love all of you. And it makes us so happy, but there's no copy paste button. I have to sit here and make it all myself again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so is this business model something that you're looking to like change or like, you know, how are you going to proceed for in, you know, in the future? Yeah, that that is something that we're definitely, we've been discussing a lot lately okay. is just like, you know, it would mean getting a sample maker and like having someone help us like do things and digitizing patterns and standardizing our patterns, which I'm the primary pattern maker because that's kind of like what I wanted to do. Like even like before children, I'm like, I want to be a pattern maker. But mm -hmm. um, so like I have been just thinking about like, okay, digitizing all the patterns and making sure they fit correctly and getting that like like done done and like having things like mock-ups like there's another thing we don't really have time to make a lot of mock-ups it's like literally learn as we go um and sometimes i would make things like for myself and i'll learn that way too um but a lot of it is a lot of trial and error and just like we don't really have time for multiple sampling and all that type of stuff so it, it's really like a time issue but if we had more um people like production wise to kind of like further that process along, which is possible, is just a question of like funding that and like all the logistics around that. And um, we have some things like in mind, but it's, we definitely have to talk to a few more people, but now that we're like officially like, oh, I, I didn't mention this on the stream, but like, we're like officially a business like LLC wise. So mm -hmm. once like the fact that we're more official will allow us to like, do a lot more things that we couldn't do when we were just a hobby business. So yes. it's it's all part of the process. And and that's that's the hard that's the hard part because also like digitizing patterns and stuff, that's a challenge. And a lot of that software is extremely expensive and not very accessible to people. I wish there was like it's funny because like I'm since I'm like also on moving into like more of a tech field, like outside of fashion, I'm just like man, I wish there was like a software where it will make it easier for you to just like make production ready patterns at an accessible, in an accessible way, not like a thousand dollar programs and like multi thousand dollar program, not just like a thousand, like more than a thousand dollars. Because what I would have to do is like literally vector draw all of the pattern pieces on like mm -hmm. Adobe Illustrator or something. And it's possible I could do it, but it's, yeah. <laughs> it's time. It's a lot of time, a lot of work. I gotta scan, scan in all the patterns, standardize your bodies. You gotta standardize your sizing. You gotta right. and don't have room for that kind of thing. Like all of these like machines and stuff are like very large. Yes, very much. Like the big pattern plotters are like a dream for me. But you need a whole studio to do that. You need a whole. It's like it's a lot. Like it's a lot that goes into it. Um, and maybe that's down down the line in the future, but. Yep. And now it's is like we're moving we're moving into hopefully getting that but it's just like I don't know if it's gonna be this year I don't know if it's gonna be next year it's just kind of like we'll see what happens mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so um in terms of you you know you mentioned now like now you are officially a business congratulations <laughs> um you know how was dealing with that I know you posted on social media that you were having you know, struggles in like, you know, finding the right people. Yeah, like I am so thankful to like, again, people in our community who have like helped us along and like referred us to like, um, we got referred to a great lawyer, um, her name is Shakira. Um, she helped us like um, finalize all of our business like paperwork stuff. So we didn't have to like 
do any of that ourselves because we were just like racking our brain like we're not we're not those type of people like there's like that legal accountant like very logistical brains and me and jen are not that i'm a little bit of that but i have a limit and i feel like when you get designers oftentimes they are not those people that's just what it is <laughs> nope. like like I like to consider myself kind of like both what they call left brain and right brain. I kind of feel like I could do both, but again, my limit is like, it's, it's too much. So I just was like, reached out to community. We was linked with a great lawyer and the lawyer also linked us to like a great accountant. And it's just kind of like this chain reaction. Once you get it going, it kind of just goes. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's been a good experience, like moving into like that official space, like getting all your banking stuff sorted out and everything is it's a lot of bureaucratic stuff but it's it's part of it and mm -hmm. new york state's um business um restrictions and rules are very complex um there's like this thing called a publication fee that you have to do which could be up to a thousand dollars <laughs> to officially officiate your business like which is like before you've even made any money so like where's that money supposed to come from exactly <laughs> Like, Thank you. We have 120 days to get that all sorted. So it's just like, it's just a timing thing. Like, oh my God, we have to make sure we get all these sales and then we got to take that money and like funnel it back in to take care of this stuff over here. Right, but which makes you, it makes it so you make basically no money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but Straight it's an up. investment into the business. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, that's kind of like how we operate. Like, if we've never really like, you know had a big profit where we could just like take that money and like fund our lives. It's really just in the beginning, you just, all the money goes back into your business. That's just yeah. how it is. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing all of this during a pandemic. Yep. Yep. So That's right. You know, how, how, how has, um, you know, that been difficult in terms of like trying to, you know, make your business legitimate as well as like make an entire collection. Yeah, that's, that's been hard because like initially, like we were working on this collection now, originally it was supposed to come out this month, um, but that didn't happen because, and before we even got to sewing, we had severe delays on one of like the core fabrics that we use for a lot of our, our dresses. Like it just mm -hmm. wasn't in stock yeah. for months. Mm -hmm. Like we, we were like contacting the company, like when is this gonna be in stock? We really need like, 15 yards of it like we need a lot of it to produce the stuff you want to produce and it just like crickets like the factory could have shut down like because yeah. the factory is actually located in the u.s um that because it was a source through fabric.com but we were like kind of looking into like where does this actually come from and apparently the company was in the u.s they didn't answer emails they just was like disappeared off the face of the earth they were just yeah. like you're the only people who make this fabric the way we like so it just was like a struggle and then finding alternatives was also a struggle and cost more money because this was actually a pretty good price point for what it was and uh, so that kind of delayed us like two months um on the onset so then i was like okay well we're just gonna do what we can so we finally was able to get a lot of our material and stuff in um, the garment district in New York City was like kind of shut down until I think the end of the summer. Um, and we finally was able to get into the trim stores and like do our thing and shop like with our local, our favorite local trim store is Daytona Trimmings, which is like a local place that they're, they're great. Like they always offer us like discounts because we always buy a lot of stuff and the staff there is really nice. So shout out to them. But um we was able to like kind of run in and get everything we needed. And it was just like, oh, this is taking a lot of time. And, and we still have to like figure out all the other things that we need to do. And then at the same time, we're like, oh, we got to figure out this whole LLC situation. And so all of that culminating at once is just like, this is a lot and we're two people. And then we wanted to like also revamp our social media and make sure we're like putting out content. And, and that's what kind of why like that started. It's pretty successful, right? Like I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it looks nice. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. So it just was like, uh, like we want to like keep on top of everything and like make it like really like legit. But at the same time, this is like one thing gets sacrificed over another. Mm -hmm. Like 
if you're dedicating a whole bunch of time to like creating social media content, that's less time you have to sew. That's mm-hmm. less time you have to talk to your lawyers and get your your shit together in terms of like the the legal and accounting and all that stuff that we don't really like. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of times where I was like putting it off, putting it off. And I'm like, I don't want to think about that right now. I want to just make pretty things. And then mm-hmm. the, the reality kicks in and you're just like, oh, mm, no, I got to just put that down for a minute and then work on this over here. And yeah, it's just been a lot of delays, a lot of like, just a lot of like challenges when it came to like everything that was going on. Um, and it was kind of like related um, to like during the, you know, the height of, like the Black Lives Matter movement and everything during the summer, um, we saw like a huge influx um, in people to our Instagram, which we were super thankful for. And everybody who like shared our brand out and like promoted us as a, another black owned um, brand, like we were like super thankful and super happy, even though it was a little bit bittersweet because it yeah. was like, the circumstances just made it like, oh, is this really what it took for people to pay attention? and kind of had to wrestle with a lot of difficult feelings in regards to that. But, you know, like we're thankful for the people who like genuinely was like, no, we're with you. We're here to support you. Like, yeah. like that, I, I couldn't like, I, I couldn't thank people more for that. Cause it is, it really kept us going and it did like, kind of like push us to keep moving forward in a way. Yeah. Cause we just felt like we love, we love doing this stuff and yeah. it, it's challenging. And we complain about like all the things we don't like, <laughs> we still do it. So yeah. And I would like to think that, you know, you know, maybe you got that attention because, you know, because of one way or another, but I think your work speaks for itself and, you know, people come to your brand because they discover it, like, you know, maybe through like, you know, the, the, like, uh, you know, uh, what was it? The, but Kate posted like a black owned, like Kawaii brands, black owned, like, um, you know, goth brands or, you know, like maybe that's the way they find it, but they stay with you because, mm-hmm you do good work and I think that's what keeps people around. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely kind of started like coming to terms with that more so because I think me and Jen, we like spoke about it really deeply because we were just kind of like having this reflective moment of like, what does this mean? And like, I, I had my doubts and I had like my insecurities about the situation, but like at the end of the day, that's really what matters. The people who like stick with us and like, mm-hmm know that we do good work and and we're also really passionate about doing good work so Mm -hmm. we're glad that shows yeah i think so and you know i think also another thing is like supporting you know supporting in that like you do have ethical practices that you shop locally like you know that you do like small bash like it's it's i think there's like a lot of reasons why you know people would want to stick with you because you know i i think you're a good friend (laughs) oh so aside from your work in terms of your brand, you um, you are not in the fashion design industry anymore. You have moved on. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, last year, also in the middle of a pandemic, I decided to <laughs> quit my job. Well, this is before. This was before the pandemic started. I quit my job in fashion. I was working at a, another children's wear company as a technical designer. Um, I was there for a couple of years and I realized like, I am not, I'm not feeling fulfilled in this mm-hmm. type of situation anymore. Um, I'm also not making as much money as I really should be. So yeah. that was another reason too. Um, so then I discovered um, the field of UX design mm-hmm. and I just ran with it. So I started um, a program with CUNY TechWorks that was in um, February of 2020. Um, and then of course, the world just turned upside down and um, I was taking classes in person and then I started doing, it was remote classes after that. And so that was, that was a great experience. Um, I, I knew it was going to be really difficult to be pivoting careers during, well, I had to real, I had to like make the realization during the time that I'm like, Oh, everything is totally flipped on its head now. I don't know how long it's going to take for me to like find work in this new industry, mm-hmm. but like, I'm, I'm really passionate about it. Like, I feel like it's definitely something um, like UX design, just web design and product design, all those like overlapping things mm-hmm. is something that can, you know, I can make a better salary in it. 
I can work in more varied industries. Yep. Um, it just opens the door to like a lot more different experiences. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm kind of like now I'm on that job job search grind as like a lot of people are now and a lot of my peers and colleagues are too. Um, so it's just like me trying to network with people in the industry, which has been really rewarding so far. And I have my portfolio, every, everything's my site is up and everything. If anybody wants to look at it, like the, the URL for it is ariadesign.tech. So that's like my my web portfolio situation is there. I've also been able to get a lot of mentorship from different people in the industry, um, which has also been great. Like people are really willing to like help you like push forward and they want to see you succeed, which is like mm -hmm. something that I didn't see in the fashion industry. Yeah. Um, people were just like, so nice and they <laughs> care if you lived or died i know that sounds terrible but it's just it really is like that and and that's yeah. not to say that the tech world is not without its flaws i know yeah. it is but at least there's a lot more sectors you can work at there's a more mm -hmm. broader range of things you can make an impact on which is kind of mm -hmm. like my reasoning for moving into it like if i wanted to move into specific like i'm really interested in like education technology and like social impact um mm -hmm service like technology all that type of stuff yeah things that, like impact and like help people yeah like, definitely so that's mm -hmm. that's kind of like what i'm i moved into now and i'm more focused i'm focused on like hopefully being employed by spring that's the goal mm -hmm. i'm just like talking to everybody and anybody in the industry right now and um i was trying to get get in get my foot in the door and i think once i'm in then it'll just be like you kind of could propel yourself through the industry and work it anywhere you want. Like the longer you're in it, the more. And and with that, like being able to like, I feel at least I feel like being able to have a more fulfilling career full time will allow me to take some of that like energy and like maybe the energy I wasn't working towards like putting fashion, like doing fashion as a job and doing fashion as my side business. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's a like lot. It's a lot. And mm -hmm. even though UX design and UI design and everything has a creative aspect to it too, a lot of it is more problem solving and creative yeah. thinking and things that I really enjoy doing. So, and taking a lot of my experiences from my fashion career and bringing it into this new field, which is mm -hmm. exactly something that's needed. So, um, you know, it's, it's just really a question of um, getting in there and making more money and then I can use that time and that money to like reinvest into my business mm -hmm. and feel more fulfilled when I'm, I don't have to worry so <laughs> about like everything else. If you're mm -hmm. doing well in your full-time career, then it just opens up a lot more doors mm -hmm. and even like doors to other people that could even help you in your own business endeavors. Yeah. And another thing is like, you know, having these, this new skill set, it's also going to help your business as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. So like um, there's a lot of things that kind of like, goes into each other, like, you know, um, understanding like metrics and like analytics and like um, our website performance and mm -hmm. designing the website. And like, cause we just recently launched our um, new website mm -hmm. I think that was back in November. And um, so just doing all that type of stuff is like, it links into each other and it just gives you like that them, it's like a sim, it's like the, a similar mindset that like you can just like um, a lot of it crosses over a lot of the same thing crosses over and um, even having a business acumen in your side side gig you could take that into your career like it, everything it kind of like goes back yeah. and forth so um, just having that um, experience is definitely is gonna is they're gonna help each other in the yeah. long run they're definitely gonna help each other. Yeah, it seems a lot more like sustainable in terms of like work life balance as well. I mean, it's kind of work work balance, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, it is work work balance. I hope you also have time for life stuff. Yeah, like that that's something else I'm like kind of having this realization like it's easy when mm -hmm. like everyone is at home, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people are at home mm -hmm. and um, you kind of like, I feel like I don't really have much of a social life. So it seems like I have all the time in the world to just 
be busy all the time, but that's not, that's, <laughs> it's, that's not, not it, yeah. it's not sustainable. Like I know once the world like opens up as everyone keeps saying we will, but it has not come. Um, Maybe we were all responsible and, you know, hmm. try yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's all that stuff. But you know, we, we all know what, what, what the story is, but you know, I, I feel like there's gonna come a time like, oh, I wanna have a life among the, the human beings in the, on the planet again, wow. And and um, then I have to come to terms with the fact like, oh, I can't be working all the time because my current schedule, like I'm always just like working. <laughs> on, <laughs> among the uh, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> so um, just, just like, yeah, just, getting getting back into like being with people i don't i don't know what that's going to translate to because i'm already like i'm already a very introverted person even though i'm kind of on the cusp i'm like introverted extroverted i'm in the middle okay. um and there's going to come a time where i'm like oh i want to do all these business and career things but people want to like hang out what what <laughs> do you have to choose hanging out with people or work and that's where it gets a little dangerous because then i i have a tendency to be a workaholic so I don't really notice until I'm like on the ground that I'm working too hard. So that that is also something I'm I'm working on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, going into the future, like as things open up and as you grow your business, what are your plans, you know? Let's see. Like um we have a lot of plans, but also like no plans at the same time. <laughs> I, I feel like everything is it's like hard to say. Hard to say, because um, we have a lot of ambitions, but it's just like, oh, like, do we actually have the means to do that? All that stuff. So, like, I know for a long time, I, I, this is like something that I cringe when I think about it. But I know a lot of people have like come to us with like commission requests and things like mm -hmm. that, and a lot of that has not been able to happen because. Mm -hmm. Commissions tend to take a lot of time, mm -hmm. because especially if you're like making something completely custom for somebody, mm -hmm. all of the logistical things that go into that, figuring out the patterning, making sure it fits correctly. Um, and when we were still like, you know, seeing people in real life, like I would fit in person with people. Yeah. So, like I literally would be like, let's find a mutual location and you can put this on and try it on. And and sometimes you don't even have access if people don't live in the same place as you. So yeah. it's before the pandemic. Um, but yeah, the commissions work. There's like a long list that I just like look at. I'm just like, all these people wanted commissions from us, but it's just like, like a year goes by or just like, I only got to work on like two. And, and it is then like for me, like sometimes I get like really upset at myself. I'm just like, oh, I wish I could do more. I could, I know I can do more, but then I gotta like also tap like the workaholic person on my shoulder of myself and be like, girl, relax. Like you ca you can't do everything. And yeah. I, I get really down on myself about it, but I, I'm also just like, you know, there's only so much me and Jen can do. Right. Um, so kind of like taking our, I guess our business model in like a different direction in terms of like doing more standardized designing so everything is not so complex. So sometimes we come up with like new brand new designs every single time. And sometimes we don't even know how difficult they're gonna be until mm -hmm. we're making it like, oh shit, we gotta do what? Like <laughs> can probably speak to this is a particular garment she is working on right now. <laughs> that is like the devil and also has caused a lot of delays because we ran out of fabric for it. We ran out of the lace for it. It's like a super layered, it has all these things going on and we and we that love it. so exciting though from I a know. consumer point of view of like, what yeah. could it be? Oh my gosh. <laughs> In theory, it's wonderful. <laughs> in practice, it's literally a demon. And it's just like, damn, like, why did we decide to do all of this? Are you doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, oh, God. Oh, my God. It's just like, yeah. So things things like that is just like, oh, and then you get delayed because then you got to reassess the design. Oh, I got to fix the pattern. Oh, I got to do this. Cause you don't really know what's going to happen. And again, mm -hmm. we don't really have time to make like a whole bunch of mock-ups and experiment because again, mm -hmm. there's more time being taken that we don't get to spend time making a final garment. So it is rough. 
it is mm -hmm. but like just reassessing our business model, figuring out like, are we going to do the pre-order route? Are we going to do the small batch route? Are we going to like try to make like, cause we want to make like a size range, like a proper yeah. size range. Like we're working on um, perfecting our larger size garments, which is something we're doing for this collection. And like, we want, we just want to do it right. And we're yeah. so hard on ourselves. Like, oh my goodness. Like, I swear mm -hmm. if any people could like, you'd be a fly on the wall with some of our conversations. <laughs> We're just like, but we have to do this. Oh, but what about this? But what if they don't like this? What if we don't do it like this? And it's just <laughs> all of these like anxieties we have. Cause I don't know. I don't know if like, I feel like creativity and anxiety, they just kind of like, kind of merge into one another. You're just always yeah. like concerned mm -hmm. about every possible tiny detail. And mm -hmm. yeah, so we just want to like standardize things. Like in mm -hmm. from my perspective, actually I have to like correct a bunch of our patterns. And like, there's things I've been learning along the way that I didn't know when we first started business. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was totally wrong. We're not doing that again. Yep. And just all of these disaster moments that you kind of mm -hmm. have to rework into how you push your business forward to scale it. Cause scaling a business, especially, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Another brand in the chat being like, yeah. hi. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, it's, it's rough, it's rough. Um, <laughs> definitely interwoven. So yeah, just like just getting over some of that stuff and being really confident, like, oh, this is, we, we know when we do A, the outcome is going to be B. Cause right mm -hmm. now we could do A and the outcome is going to be X, Y, Z and two and 55. And like, yeah. Um, like it's going to be pi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So figuring that out is probably the next step. And like, once yeah. we have all of our the, the annoying legal and accounting things is kind of like done, squared away, everything is taken care of. And the IRS is not gonna be like, hey, excuse me. <laughs> I, hear, I hear you're making frilly dresses. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah, because that's kind of always been the anxiety, like when it was a hobby. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh no. Are you frozen? Uh, hey guys in the chat, can you tell me if stuff is freezing for you? <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was just me. Oh, okay, was... you're back. Oh, <laughs> are we back? Are we good? We're back. Yeah. Okay, great. I was like, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're back. Um, but yeah, just again, like I don't know what I said last, but like the legal. All the stuff you know, like getting that done, getting being confident on that, and like having someone else handle it because we're we're not we're not doing that. So, yeah, uh, just this the scaling stuff and mm -hmm. the standardization of our process because our process right now is a clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we do good. I, I mean, like I feel like we're pretty organized, but my brain is always like, but is it organized enough? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's always like something like, no, but there's, there's always something in the, in the looming in the background is going to like throw a wrench in it. Like, but did you think of this? Did I'm always like, could I make another spreadsheet to <laughs> yeah. organize my thoughts? Oh my God. You should see like our, we have a notion page now for all of our business stuff, spreadsheets, like, like Kanban boards, like, oh my God, it's wild. Like it's, it's so wild. Like, mm -hmm. Oh man. Spreadsheets. Yeah. We, we said spreadsheets. <laughs> we live on that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. We can always, yeah, it's always, we always want to strive for better. That's the thing. It's, we're ne it's never enough for us. It's just like, <laughs> but that one like flaw, that one like tiny stitch that's like out of place, everyone's going to know. And no one knows. No one even knows. <laughs> Like, it's like that oh my gosh i've seen those um like tiktok videos where it's like who's gonna know how would they know yeah oh my god is it's so it's <laughs> so, we got we got another designer in yeah. here <laughs> oh my god yeah it's the worst, it's the worst but yeah, we, but yet we're still here doing the thing <laughs> you are you're, you're doing the thing <laughs> So yeah, I think we're getting towards the end of like, you know, this interview. Is there anything else that you would like want to show us or, you know, talk about like your studio space or like anything you're making currently? 
Yeah. So I'm like trying to think about, I'm literally sitting right now in <laughs> this technically the studio space. My lab yeah. is in front of a, let me see if I can just kind of like jimmy this a little bit. <laughs> Do this the real janky way, but. So Ooh. this is literally <laughs> what it looks like. It's a desk. There's also other stuff over here. Um, but like I have my my brother, good old brother Serger, mm -hmm. that's been strong for years. The singer stylist machine that is also I singers are good for like kind of like hardy home machines. Right. Oh no, did she freeze again? <laughs> now we just have a view of the sewing machine. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she'll be back. Um, <laughs> While well, that's happening, I guess, uh, do you guys in the chat want to like <laughs> interview the sewing machine? Um, let's see. How, what are questions you could ask a sewing machine? Oh, what are fabrics that you have sewn that um, have been the most difficult? Oh, oh no, she's gone. <laughs> we'll see if she comes back. Other than that, I guess, um, think about, think about um, maybe questions that you would want to ask her for when she comes back and if, <laughs> Oh, Siobhan. <laughs> Jen, maybe I could just interview you while she's like working on coming back here. <laughs> but like through the chat. <laughs> Fabric options, favorites, least funny stories, etc. Okay, okay. We're gonna interview Jen who's in the comments. So yeah, Jen, um what what are you working on currently that you can tell us about? Um and uh you know what's what's been difficult about that for you <laughs> wait wait for it to probably like type some stuff <laughs> thank you everyone for sticking with us through technical difficulties <laughs> Okay, so Jen is currently working on a construction that you have never worked on before, a three-tiered garment, which sounds great. I love it, I want it. <laughs> oh, okay, this is like the difficult garment that Arya was talking about, right? <gasps> I feel that, I feel that in my heart. <laughs> each, um, each tier is about 240, in 240 inches? Wait, 240 inches? <laughs> and the lace is from China. So, oh, it, was it like back ordered? Oh, we have another question in here. Who are your biggest inspirations as, as designers? Jen, if you want to let us know who you take inspiration from. Oh, did it just take a long time to get here because it had to come from China? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in theory, if things are FedEx from China, it can take like two days, but even FedEx, like fast shipping has been delayed. Sometimes it takes like, um, I think, oh. <laughs> Hi, Aria. Oh my God, my internet just died. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I've been interviewing Jen. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there are those oh, comments. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think Yay. she's been typing out, um, someone asked about uh, design inspirations. Like who do you take inspiration from as um, in terms of like designers and stuff? 
Oh, nice. Oh, nice. and here we have a comment from Jen. Inspiration from Old Swords, your Couture, and Dolce & Gabbana that you try to... Yeah, their stuff is, like, elaborate, which I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, the designs that both of you do kind of fit in with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Jen holding it down. I'm <laughs> decided to just be like, I'm going to cut out right in between. That's, that's teamwork, though. That's why you guys are, that's why you guys are, you know, doing it, working together. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about you? What are your design inspirations? Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of like historical fashion inspiration. Like, I feel like that's kind of like I've been leaning into that a lot more because that was kind of what led me into, well, two things led me into Lolita fashion. It was just like general goth anime nonsense that you randomly Google when you're 14. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, like Malice Miser and VK music and all that, mm -hmm. but also um, like that, this like Victorian Edwardian fashion, um, also 18th century fashion, um, like a lot of like, I love going to like the Met Museum and looking at all the interior. You're so shows. close to it. It's no. like, you get to just go. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's I, I, been like, wild. I took that for granted now, because I'm just like with this pandemic situation, like I'm like, oh, I can just like skip off to the museum whenever I want. But um, yeah. Um, true to your teenage goth self. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that has definitely stayed true, like I'm like, it is so funny because we always talk about like, oh, are we a goth brand? Like people kind of been like they describe us as a goth brand. And I'm like, I guess so now. Like it just yeah. kind of <laughs> and, I didn't mean for this to happen, but it's what happened. But it's what happened. So it's just like, oh, I, I guess this is what it is. And it doesn't help that like both me and Jen, that's just like our sentiments in life. So it's just like, yeah. It, yeah. Well, we, I'm here for another goth brand. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and then Jen, I think I see Jen in the comments, like when we make things like not black, people don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. And we're just like, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because um, it just kind of happened. And everything that like our best selling items always been the all black things. Um, it's just good. Yeah, and, and that's that's that. We're just like, okay, well, that's what the people want. That's what we want. Give, Let's give the people what they want. Exactly. So that kind of is what it ended up being, like, over time. It just was like, oh, I guess we're goth brand. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's also asking, do you think you can tease the star, 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 star? <laughs> what? I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> Let's let, let's see. Let's see what I can do. One one one. Star, 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 star. Oh, I'm coming back. <laughs> okay, we're gonna wait for her to come back. <laughs> we're, we're gonna get some exclusive sneak peeks, never before seen footage. <laughs> okay. A celestial headdress. <laughs> Let's see what, okay, so what we got here is something I was like working on <laughs> yesterday. I'm gonna kind of like show it without showing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm so weird about like, I wanted to be surprised. I'm just like, I don't people wanna see things. Okay, so like, I don't know if you can see this. We tail it. Oh, the lace. Yeah. <gasps> Ooh, okay, I, I, it's a little bit like super yeah. dark because of like camera reasons, but I can see some crisscrossing. Yeah. It's not completely done yet, but it's something that we're working on. Yeah. Yes. I want it. Thanks. <laughs> it was like I can show a little something, something, you know. Yeah. yeah. For for the people. Yeah. So that's Chris another thing thanks. with like this new collection. Um, let me just say because it's it's an old school themed collection. Like we mm -hmm. have it like. We've teased it out. We haven't like did all the promo stuff for it yet. Cause again, mm -hmm. that takes time. So <laughs> who to thunk? <laughs> yeah. Just magically make a, a clone of me do all the social media posts while I'm making stuff in, in the corner. Or people are loving the idea of old school. Yeah. So it's, it's I guess it's more like kind of like a neo, neo old school sort of situation. So um when working on a bunch of accessories yesterday, that was only like one thing. I made like six things yesterday um they're all not done at like bases like headdress bases and things i got to do all the embellishments but 
that lace, like the the that Clooney, like torsion lace, I think it's called sometimes. Mm -hmm. That lace is not cheap. <laughs> And it's not easy to find um, mm -hmm. good quality. Yeah, you don't really find it in like a lot of modern garments either. It's like not mm -hmm. like the kind of like the chunkier. Yeah. Like it's not what they go for. No. And I understand why. I think it, it's it's like different, difficult to produce a, a lot of it, I guess. And I know a lot of the brands do like the <sighs> embroidered tool laces because they just Overall, it is, they're also easy to work with too. So I, I can see why, but like gathering a bunch of like the, the cotton laces, mm -hmm. like, oh man, that's, it's rough. <laughs> it's a lot. The amount, yeah, you, we, at one point we were walking around in the garment district with like suitcases and bags and bags of lace and spending hours in the, and again, Daytona trimming. I, I got to keep shouting them out because they came in clutch. Like, <laughs> They're the only place that has in around us that has like all the types of like laces that we wanted to use. Like mm -hmm. everybody else, either they don't carry a lot of it or the quality is crap or the price is way too high. Like to the point where we it just wouldn't make sense for us to buy it. Like I don't want to like like bad mouth certain trim stores, but there's a couple of them that are like, okay, this is so high marked up that we can't we can't use it because like it's double or triple the price that it would be if we bought it from somewhere else. And yeah, because yeah. as a business, you have to think about costs. Like if mm -hmm. someone's buying like expensive lace for themselves to just make for a garment for, you know, whatever, fine, whatever. Yeah. But you, you have to think about like, what can I sell this for? <laughs> right, right. And it won't be like, like way higher than anybody's willing to pay for it too. So it's just like finding that balance, pricing things and sourcing the material again, that's like always a challenge, but is part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Does anyone else in the comments have any questions? Wait a little bit. I think we got we got a good amount of stuff done. We answered yeah. we answered a lot. <laughs> yeah, I feel we did we did good with the technical issue and all. Like, uh, of course, like I think it was fun. It was yeah, fun. <laughs> I, I had a time. It was, it was fun, and I'm just like I feel so motivated to like keep doing things i know like everybody like wants the like they're so eager to see what we're up to and mm -hmm. we can be very secretive sometimes <laughs> like, we don't want to show anything because what if it all catches on fire so it's just like oh yeah at some point i interviewed the sewing machine it was fine <laughs> oh man like my bobbin case like broke i thought my bobbin case broke the other day and i'm just like damn how am i gonna like replace this like oh my god i'm right in the middle of making something and it's broken like oh my god yeah oh, worse than running out of bobbin thread oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my gosh, do you love absolutely love when you've been sewing for like a good amount of time and you're like the bobbin thread is <laughs> And then you pulled out all the pins and like it's all it's ruffled. It's all ruffled. It's placed so nice. And then you're like, it wasn't sewing this whole time. I want to die. Jen says she doesn't like it. You don't like it? You don't like that? <laughs> One of the worst things ever. Oh my God. It makes me want to cry just thinking about it. Yeah. Or like, or like the other day when I like sewed a bunch of ruffles, like placement ruffles on one of the garments, realized it was too much. I had to take all the ruffles off and start over. And it poked a bunch of little tiny holes in the sample. And I'm like, I gotta fix this because I can't do this over. Mm -hmm. It's all I got, we gotta fix this. And then you gotta go backtrack and unpick and fix and spray things with water until the holes come out, which is like a nice, a good trick. Like if something has like a hole, like it's punctual, like a pinhole, hole, yeah. spray it, spray it, spray it, let it sit there for a while. Don't manipulate it too much. It will come out, hopefully. Unless it's yeah. like satin or silk or something, then you're in trouble. But yeah, um, I feel like you can also steam some stuff out. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. It kind of yeah. shrink, it like relaxes the uh, fibers and like it kind of shrinks it down. Right, right, because, mm -hmm. ooh, so <laughs> I have so many nightmares. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. Yeah. Um, you know, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to, I guess, they can probably contact you directly, right? And like, mm -hmm. hey. Like, you can DM yeah. me on Instagram. You slide can, in there. Yeah, just sliding. I'm always answering my messages and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and yeah. on Instagram, your personal Insta is? Oh, yeah. Dix Macab, D I X M A C B R E. Did I spell that right? R E. Yes. Yeah. I, I spelled it wrong. Hold on. There we go. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. just, just message me. I'm, I'm around. <laughs> yeah. And also follow her for great outfits. <laughs> I don't post very often now, but it, I have a backlog of like a thousand things. Like, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for um, agreeing to this interview. Um, I had a lot of fun and I'm really, really looking forward to yeah, your collection that's going to come out. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it too because we want it to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so everyone, um, if you haven't already, go to the um, Lilith Ad Adalia website and subscribe to their emailing list because I believe you guys are going to be giving news through that first. Mm -hmm. Most likely. Either that or IG. It's mm -hmm. either IG or the newsletter. That's like our primary... Um, contact like you can mm -hmm. we'll put most of the updates there because and then after this i also post a couple more sneak peek videos of things i'm working on this weekend on our ig stories over on our page instagram page so i'll do that yeah. too yes so yeah um that's it thank you so much for thank, thank you so, um for being interviewed yeah this, of course. <laughs> this is so much fun and thanks for jen in the comments as well <laughs> okay Bye. Bye.